Well, good evening. Welcome to another episode of Hunker Down and Huddle Up. Tonight, we're with the members of the 1980 championship team. My name is Brian Dill. I'm your University of Georgia alumni president. I'm a double dog, uh, class of 94 and 2019 from Irwin County, former Redcoat alum, and so glad you're able to join us here tonight uh, with this austere group. We're so thrilled to have them, and we're excited to talk a little championship football and a little crystal ball into, into 2020. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, before I turn it over uh, and start the program, your chat feature is on tonight, available to everyone to interact, uh, share memories, have fun. I know football can get a little emotional. We all want to win every game, but let's keep, let's keep it PG. And I invite each of you to introduce yourself, yourself using the chat feature tonight. Name where you are, where you're from, what year you graduated if you're an alum, and uh, feel free to join in on that chat and Q&A section. So uh, we'll lead a discussion with our panelists for about 30 minutes or so, then open it up to questions and go from there. So at this time, we'll, we'll have, bring in our panelists and special guests and get the party started tonight. I think this first gentleman really needs no introduction. Uh, the legendary coach, Vince Dooley, 25 years at University of Georgia. Vince, thanks for joining us tonight, Coach. We're, we're so glad to have you. While we're waiting on him to, to click on, we got a, the freshman from Charlotte, North Carolina, Mr. Scott Williams. Scott, thanks for joining us, man. <laughs> hey, good to see you. Hope all is well. Appreciate it. <laughs> also in the house, a junior from the great state of Lowndes, Valdosta, Georgia, Mr. Buck Ballou. Great to be with you tonight. Just such an honor to be with these guys that you've uh, asked to join tonight. Coach Dooley, Scott Williams, Frank Ross. I mean, and this is the reason why we're able to win big. We had great people on that team. Absolutely. Then the, the senior, one of our captains from Greenville, South Carolina, Brother Frank Ross. Frank, thanks for joining us, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And it's a great to see everybody here. And uh, let's have a good time tonight. While we're waiting on Coach Dooley to, to link back in, We'll start with Scott. Uh, just kind of catch us up, Scott, what you've been doing, the degree you earned, position you played at Georgia, coming in as a freshman, and uh, what you up to these days. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I came in from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina that year and was part of what I think was one of the most amazing freshman classes that UGA has ever seen. Uh, me, Herschel, Terry Hogue, Daryl Jones, Freddie Gilbert, Clarence K, uh, Charlie Dean, DJ Jones, Mike Weaver, Melvin Simmons. Man, it was absolutely phenomenal. But um, ended up graduating, going back and finishing up in 85, speech communications major, and uh, bounced around in the NFL for a few years. Ended up coming uh, out of the league and going to work with Turner Broadcasting in 91. Worked with them for 18 years. Had a lot of success there. Helped launch a few networks with uh, Ted Turner and ended up going over to manage corporate partnerships with the Atlanta Braves after that. Stayed over there five years and uh, ESPN came along and plucked me for the start of what we call now the SEC Network. And so uh, I'm head of sales for the SEC Network, and I also work, uh, don't tell Commissioner Sankey, I work on the ACC property as well. <laughs> but uh, Disney is a parent company, and ESPN, SEC Network, is, is, is what I, who I work for right now. And it's an absolutely phenomenal job, man, and I, I, I get up and I love it every day. Awesome. Good to hear. Appreciate you joining us tonight. Frank, yeah. you're retired, but sounds like you... Uh, Trying your best to travel the world. Yep, uh, I retired about five and a half years ago. I was a double dog at University of Georgia, 80, 81 undergraduate and 83 masters. Um, went on and had uh, th two other companies I worked for, I finished, but I ended up with the Coca-Cola company and I uh, was vice president of Hispanic strategies. Uh, as you know, I'm originally from Barcelona, Spain. So uh, that was a good fit. Uh, did that for 20 years, retired about five and a half years ago, and uh, just serve on a couple of boards, the All Star Health System Board, which is a large hospital system in Georgia, and then also the JW uh, Fanning Institute for Leadership Development at the University of Georgia. And uh, my wife and I just uh, enjoy traveling. The COVID's kind of put a little bit of a, 
uh, stop to that, but uh, we'll get back on it and um, enjoy life. All right. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Frank. Uh, Buck, in the big city, uh, great state of Lowndes and Valdosta. I think you're in Atlanta now. Tell us what you're doing these days. Well, I ended up, uh, you know, playing baseball and football at Georgia and, you know, went and finished up my degree at Valdosta State University and uh, was able to coach for another great Bulldog, Mike Cavan, there for two years coaching quarterbacks and receivers and able to finish up my degree and got a uh, speech communications degree and we're hoping to one day get into the journalism field and that's what I've done the last 20 years hosting a sports talk radio show in Atlanta which is where I always wanted to live and raise a family and my wife Kelly and I she's a UCF grad and we met uh, at a TV station as I uh, got the career started in Savannah and we've got three children a daughter a junior at South Forsyth High School here at Cumming and two sons uh, one in middle school and one in ninth grade and uh, just been loving living in Atlanta and talking sports here for the last 20 years. Well I certainly have enjoyed listening to you and uh, glad you've been a fixture in the Atlanta market and sports talk uh, for sure we really appreciate you joining us tonight and being a part of the of the conversation. Coach Dooley, I see you. Thanks yeah. so much for joining us. My Glad technical to assistant came back uh, at the right this time. Gotta love technology. What have you been up to these days? I know Master Gardening is on the list and maybe a book or two. Yeah, that's, uh, it's great that you, uh, that I have something that I can get out of the house with. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of my golf. And the great thing about it is, is that I don't have to have a tea time and I don't have to have anybody to play with. I can just go outside in the garden and there's always something to do. So uh, that's just one of my uh, interests that I've enjoyed uh, being at Georgia. I remember that uh, we came here 55 years ago and I told my wife, Barbara, I said, Barbara, don't get too comfortable. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. And uh, even in those days, people, coaches didn't stay very long at places. So we were very fortunate to have been at one place for 55 years and to raise a family all in one place and to be able to survive some crises. And the reason that I was able to do that is because of some of these fellas that are on this show tonight. Uh, that's that's quite the understatement, but a testament to you as a coach and uh, recruiting and getting things going back in, in uh, 1980. Let's let's dive right in if we can, Coach. And starting your 17th season that year in 1980, give us a little flavor of what you thought you had in the preseason and kind of how you thought the season was going to shape up walking in there. Well, I knew we had a solid football team on both sides of the ball, and our kicking game was good. I think the big uh, question uh, was uh, at tailback, and it was kind of a, a missing piece of the puzzle. And as many people know, that missing piece turned out to be a young freshman named Herschel Walker, who came in in our first ball game when we were down and were able to score two touchdowns and to get us off and going. And this team developed over a period of time an ability to somehow, some way, uh, win a football game. And it was not only Herschel being the, the primary player, but uh, others that had to step up at various times. And uh, Scott Warner, as an example, was kind of the, uh, uh, the Herschel Walker of defense. He just went into the Hall of Fame. And uh, he actually won the Clemson game for us. And then you got Buck that's on the on our show tonight. And without he and Lindsey Scott, there's no way we could have beaten Florida. So always somebody would step up at an opportune time uh, to be able to uh, get us out of a situation and end up somehow, some way, we always said, of uh, winning all of them and to become the only undisputed. Uh, undefeated national champions. Outstanding. 
I want to kind of pose this next question to Scott. You're, you're a freshman tied in, first game, Neyland Stadium. Uh, tell me what's that, what that's like and kind of your, your initial thoughts as you walked into uh, all that orange. Man, <laughs> I had never seen anything like that before. I tell you, it was a, an amazing experience, but, uh, you know, a lot of nerves, a, a lot of questions. I, I felt like we had a really good team. I think a lot of us on that freshman class provided some depth and special team help and, 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 and practice and scout team help for, for seniors like Frank and, 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 and great players like Buck and, and, and Lindsay and those guys. But I felt like we had a pretty good team. Uh, obviously, you know, my mindset was, you know, okay, can we come in here and get this one? Can we get it? And for a while and for a long while, it, it didn't feel like we were going to get it. But I, but I recall the great thing about that team was, and it, it was always moments when we were in stressful times that somebody would always step up and make a play. And we always felt like somebody was going to make a play. And it didn't necessarily have to be Herschel because we had what I thought was the best defense in the world. <laughs> I mean, I thought, I thought, you know, Cisco, I call him Cisco Frank, who I uh -huh. wanted to be able to run like when I came in as a freshman, combination of he and Eddie Me Cleaver Weaver and Jimmy Payne, and then, you know, safeties that we had. So we were strong up the middle. We had just an incredible defense. So um, I was, I was, I was happy that we were able to pull that out, but there were times when I didn't think we were. <laughs> well, Frank and Buck coming in as upperclassmen, you know, the, the, kind of the same question. You start in the season, kind of have a good feel for what you got. Your coaching staff have prepared you, but, uh, Buck, start with you. Your thoughts on kind of walking into that game and kicking things off that year? Well, I was uh, totally confident in the group we had, uh, you know, all across the board. Uh, offense, defense, the coaching staff was, uh, the, Coach Dooley's coaching staff was, was so talented and, and, and really awesome. So once Herschel settled in at running back, you know, I just, I didn't, I looked around, I, I thought we had a team that could do something big. And, I thought Coach Dooley made a great move at halftime there at Tennessee, getting Herschel in the game. And uh, we also, after that game, made a, a great coaching move on the offensive line where we moved Matt Hudson over to right tackle and slid our tackle uh, down to guard Jim Blakewood. And that really uh, set us off uh, and set Herschel and that running game off in the games after Tennessee. He really went on a roll after that. And so just an example of, of coaches getting the job done and, and making smart decisions. And, you know, as uh, Scotty just mentioned, some of the talent on that team, but it wasn't just the talent. It was the character uh, of these guys. There were some big moments throughout the season where we had different guys step up and deliver when we needed it the most. And yeah. you know, we had a little uh, saying at the time, you know, big team, little me, and we all had t-shirts with a big team across the chest and then a very little me underneath the team. And, and that whole season and, uh, sort of showed exactly uh, what that phrase was meant to uh, display. Uh, this is a team inside and out, great coaching staff, great leadership, and some really talented guys. So it was just an honor to be a part of that group. Well, Frank, I know, uh, I'm, I'm just glad you made it past the pig incident. We won't go there tonight, but uh, <laughs> you, you, you walk in, you walk into the season as a, as a team captain and a leader. Uh, give us your impression of what you saw in front of you. Well, I mean, obviously going up there, I, mean, I felt I felt we had a, a strong team. It wasn't like we we're made up of all excellent players at each position. I think we're all above average players, with the exceptions of some players. Obviously, Lindsey, Herschel, Warner. Uh, but I felt like as a team, we were very strong together, uh, which as we've seen, you can have great players. If they're not strong playing together, it doesn't really make a big difference. 
Um, so I felt I felt good going into it, but in the, the day you've got to win to prove. You can say, oh, I, we could have done this, we could have done that, but you got to win. And going in there, the things I remember, it was extremely hot. It was, I think it was the first game played in the South with over 100,000 people because Tennessee had just expanded their stadium. It was AstroTurf. If I remember correctly, it was like 95 degrees with some ridiculous <laughs> humidity level. During warm-ups, the, the, the turf was probably around 115, 120 degrees. And walk into the walk into the locker room after warm-ups, and you have to change your, your undershirt because it's soaking wet. But that that game, I'll tell you, I don't know if Coach Duke agrees or not, but I felt like that was probably the best team we played in 1980 when we played them. Now, they ended up having a pretty good season. They got some players hurt after – they got some hurt in our game and got several hurt down the road. But they ended up, I believe, losing to Alabama in the last second field goal, losing to Southern Cal in the last second field goal. Um, but when we played them, they had full complement of players. I thought that was probably the, the, the best team. Uh, one good thing about that game is that we had that freshman class today would be ranked one plus. I mean, it was that good of a, of a, of a freshman class, which allowed us to have some really good athletes on our special teams. Yeah. Uh, and as you saw, um, that's what made the difference in that game when we finally got cranked up on that punt that Joe Happy uh, knocked out of the guy's hands and then, of course, ended up going out of, out, of, out of the end zone. But that goes to show you somebody stepped up every game. And if you look at the season, somebody stepped up. And it wasn't like Scotty said, a Herschel or, or Scott every time. It was somebody that maybe had started in the past. And all of a sudden, there were seniors – and weren't starting anymore, but they bought into the concept of team me yeah. and we're not disruptors. We had no disruptors on that team that year, which is unbelievable. You usually have a disruptor or two here and there. And they took the attitude is I'm going to do the best I can in what I'm doing, even though I'm not a starter anymore, I'm going to do the best I can. And then the coaches did a super job, obviously starting with coach Julie. I've, I've always said, I have a saying, the speed of the pack is determined by its leader. And Coach Dooley really set the tone that year of everybody focusing on the, the game coming up. Don't worry about anything else. That game coming up. And made us believe that if we didn't prepare and play as hard as we could as a team, we could get beat every game, even against Vanderbilt. I remember him just pounding that, and we bought into that. Somebody, uh, Herschel called it drinking the Kool-Aid. But <laughs> to me, it's, it's buying into the vision. And we bought into that vision, and I think we had a great senior class that led – by example, and um, the rest is history. Coach, coach, time in there a little bit, talking about your coaching staff. You, you have a 17-year veteran with you on defense with Coach Russell. I believe George Hafner, you know, offensive coordinator, was in his first season. Talk a little bit about your coaching nucleus and how that really came together for you. Well, Coach Russell was with me uh, for 17 years. That was his last year. And as some people remember, he went on and started the program at Georgia Southern. And uh, he won three national championships at uh, Georgia Southern. So we were together even before we uh, came to Georgia uh, as coaches, assistant coaches. And uh, he, was, uh, he was a player's coach, an all-four coach, and was great with morale. George Hafner was a very sound football coach. Uh, and the, the fact that uh, I believe very strongly in being sound, what does that mean? It means that you're fundamentally good and you don't, uh, you learn how not to beat yourself before you learn to beat other people. In other words, you got to not make mistakes. And I think that particular year we led the nation uh, in a turnover ratio. In other words, we had more takeaways than we did uh, turnovers. Uh, so he was a very fine coach. So we had a, a good staff and uh, all worked hard and uh, all were uh, into the program uh, just, like, uh, just like the players. Just thinking about, uh, I know everybody wants to gravitate toward uh, the play at Florida. And of course, that was an incredible turning point because that, that catapulted you guys uh, into the national title game. But uh, maybe think about a, a defining play or a turning point in another game that, in your opinion, really changed the season uh, and to the positive. 
<laughs> there are so many of them. <laughs> it's, it's hard to pin one of them. Uh, I remember that uh, we were playing uh, George Rogers in South Carolina. And, uh, and George Rogers won the Heisman that year, even though Herschel had a great game as well. But uh, George did it over a long period of time. And right at the end of the ball game, they were coming down the field. And George was going six and eight and seven and six. So we had to have something big happen. And uh, who, I don't know, remembers who hit, hit him, but somebody hit him and uh, somebody recovered the ball and uh, we were able to stop him. Otherwise, he probably would have still been running and would have scored and won the ball game. So that's just one incident of somebody stepping up. Uh, go back to the Tennessee ball game. Tennessee was on our four yard line. We had a one point lead. We had to have a big play. And uh, I think our linebacker knocked the ball out of the Tennessee running back. We got the ball and recovered the fumble. And then uh, we had a, had a punter that really hadn't punted for Georgia before. And uh, Jim Broadway, and uh, he had to kick out of the end zone. And the, the kick before, he sliced the ball. Well, that time, he kicked it 57 yards. And they, didn't, they couldn't get a first down. So uh, you could go through the season from the first game and point to individuals that stepped up and made big plays beyond the ones that most people know. Gentlemen, chime in with your with your defining play or turning point, something that really stood out for you guys. Scott, go ahead. Man, like Coach Dooley said, there were so many plays that, that, that stick out in my mind. Obviously, the Tennessee game, uh, because I was, you know, back at that time, UGA was on the quarter system. And I had every class with Herschel that first quarter. And, you know, a lot of us, which is a little bit different than way, way, way they do it today because the internet is so prevalent. But we all would see each other do, on recruiting trips and talk about playing together and things of that nature. And, and he was the final piece to the puzzle of that recruiting class. But uh, that play, uh, you know, him racing down the sideline against South Carolina, outrunning an angle, him against Ole Miss diving over the top and flipping, Frank setting the tone of the defense, filling the A gap, knocking some running backs out. <laughs> Scott Warner interceptions and rolling the dice in the end zone uh, and getting chased down by McSwain and the Clemson game, who, by the way, was a 100 meter track champion from out of North Carolina. You know, the Florida game, Lindsey Scott, you know, the great step up and move by Buck. Um, you know, he doesn't get as much credit as he should. I mean, if people saw what we did in preparation for games um, and the way he controlled the offense and the way he calmly made everybody, you know, settle down and, and get focused and had that demeanor about him, you know, our entire offense kind of took on that demeanor. Um, and so there's just a lot of plays throughout that year. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I tell you, ultimately <laughs> in the Sugar Bowl, that, that really caps it all for me. That was just, you know, you can capsulize that whole game for me. And that's, that's a standout for me. All right, Frank. Well, I mean, if you look at it from a, a strategic, logical point of view, you have to say the Tennessee game is the most important game. Uh, because if you lose that game, you're probably not going to win the SEC championship. And you're probably definitely not going to go to the national championship game. So to me, that being the first game of the year and just having to be an SEC team, which normally we didn't start, if I remember correctly, with SEC teams. We started used with ACC or an independent uh, or another conference. So to me, that was a critical, critical game because it opened the gate for possibilities. If you lose that game, your possibilities are, are, are really uh, limited at that point. So to me, that was that was a key game. And of course, I'm with Scotty. I mean, 
uh, the Sugar Bowl. You've made it that far. You've worked that hard. You've gone through all these uh, miracles with the guys that you fought and and and, and cried with and, and laughed with, and all of a sudden you you're at the opportunity to to win it all. And of course, just that game was a total team game once again. I mean, everybody stepped up uh, when they had to step up. And I mean by that is special team stepped up on uh, the long kickoff recovery, which I think that play epitomized that team uh, because of the unselfishness and the commitment that those two kids, Bob Kelly and Steve Kelly, made of running full speed. Because if they had slowed down even a – if they had been upset because they weren't starting, that play never occurs. You've got the Terry Hogue block field goal, which we had practiced because we saw, wow. we saw a, a low trajectory kicker. And he said, we're going to block this thing uh, into the game. Buck throws to, to, to Amp when we have to have it. I mean, that's clutch. Uh, you know, defense creating four to five turnovers. So that was the epitome of a total team game. Well, you were involved in one of those turnovers. So tell them about that. <laughs> uh, coach, 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 there's two of them. Dude, I'm sorry, I underestimated you. Go ahead. Hey, 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 coach, you shorted me again. <laughs> All right, talk, talk. Tell us. No, 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 no. You remember the Terry Hogue one? You remember in practice where he was supposed to step on my back and then, but he kicked me in the butt. You remember that? Yeah, and, yeah. I, and Coach Russell said, we better not do that again. We need him for the game. So I told Terry before the game, I said, I'm going to shoot through their legs, the guard and the tackle's leg. And, and, and that's going to make them scrunch down. And, uh, and the first time, he didn't get it. The second time is when he made it. Well, the third time, you may not remember this, the third time I told Terry, I said, Terry, they know what's happening now. And I said, they're going to come after you and let me go, thinking that I'm just shooting at their legs, so you're going to get flipped. I said, but I'm going to try to get through. And that's exactly what they did. As soon as the ball was snapped, both of the garden tackle pulled their legs back so I wouldn't uh, hit their knees. And I went crawling through there, and I felt the air of the ball in my hand. I was that close. Um, but that was funny because we were kind of playing a, a chess game with them. And, then of course, the other one was uh, when, I, when I tackled uh, the fullback head on, and they caused, caused the fumble. And, of course, uh, Chris Welton recovered it. And then the offense took it in, and that's the play where Herschel ran wide and Jimmy Womack uh, decleated their defensive back coming up to, to try to stop Herschel. And uh, that, that was – a that was a heck of a block on, on Womack. We just had players that would step up when they had to. That's that's the bottom line. Well, you remember that uh, Terry Hogue was not even going to be going to the Sugar Bowl, but he had this great ability to, to block field goals and extra points. And he did that about three times in practice. And after the fourth time, I sent him in and says, go get Pack. You're going to New Orleans. <laughs> I, remember, I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> a lot of us auditioned for that. We were jumping and running over the back of players and diving and flipping and doing all kinds of stuff. But Terry had a knack for it. He did that. Yeah. Oh, a actually, Coach, if you remember, you know who the first person y'all chose to try that? Was Freddie Gilbert. And Coach Russell told me, said, Frank, I want you to line up at the tight guard and go to your knees when the ball's hiked. And Freddie, he was a, he was a 200-meter uh, uh, hurdle champion in the state of Georgia at 220 pounds. And so he was the first guy we gave a shot to. And he, he kicked me in my butt cheek, <laughs> called the Charlie horse. And that's when he's called you, – you, you'd mentioned to him, try Terry Ho, because you'd seen him blocking all those blocks. And that's when we put him in there, and he did the same thing on my other butt cheek. And uh, so then we came up with a strategy of how we could get him through there. But uh, it was uh, – if Coach Russell hadn't noticed on that film the low trajectory of their kicker, that that, that never occurs because we never think about trying that strategy. Yeah. Well, Buck, I'm going to ask you your opinion on uh, the same, and then I'm going to uh, probably go in the direction that everybody wants us to go in, and we'll talk about that Florida series. So fire away, Buck. Well, first, let me just say that uh, it was just such an honor to play with Scotty Williams and Frank Ross. I uh, love both of those guys and always treasure those times we spent together and uh, those seasons in Athens. Uh, you know, I look at the close games that season and Clemson, after the Tennessee game we spoke about, but Clemson, Scott Warner just 
put on a Hall of Fame performance that day and, and really carried us to the finish line and won a highly contested, intense. I mean, that was the biggest rivalry we had at the time was Clemson, in my opinion. So Scotty saved us that day with his performance. Then later in the season, South Carolina was huge. Defense had to step up at the end. We got two fumbles on George Rogers. Tim Parks forced one. And then, again, Scott Warner came through. And another, uh, you know, five minutes left in the fourth quarter. We're hanging on to a 13-10 lead. And he finds a way to get through there and strip the ball from George. And, you know, we had some uh, guys step up there. Uh, we, we know the Florida game like the back of our hand. And just so happy that Lindsey... Uh, stepped up for us there. Uh, you know, he had faced some adversity that season. That was the first touchdown he scored. And I remember the night before the game, we were roommates together. And, you know, we're talking about the disappointing season he had had. And, you know, you, you just search for, you know, the right thing to say. And, you know, I can remember telling him, look, uh, tomorrow might be the day. So, you know, let's, uh, let's believe that, you know, and he just, he just stepped up so big for us that day. I'm just so proud of him for that. And then, you know, we had that Auburn game the next week, so there wasn't any time to celebrate. And I remember right before halftime, it was a close game, and we were on the Auburn one-yard line with a few seconds left, no timeouts. Uh, we had a fumble there, and we're able to, uh, you know, uh, get back up to the line of scrimmage. The time was running out, and we didn't really have an audible system set up, but we did have a clock play that would stop the clock. And, uh, you know, we didn't want to do that, but I looked at Norris Brown, our tight end, and, and pointed to run a quick route in the back of the end zone. And, you know, I watched the video uh, recently and Herschel at the snap of the ball was looking at me like, what are you doing? But I uh, was able to get it to Norris and he went up and made a huge play for a touchdown that I, I gave us a little separation there at halftime at Jordan Hare. So that, that play stands out. And then, you know, the way Frank and that defense played against Notre Dame was just nothing short of spectacular. And, you know, Herschel's performance was the greatest I've ever seen. That game where he separated the shoulder and came back and just uh, toughed it out in the biggest game of our lives. And we'll always be indebted to Herschel for that performance that day. Well, we'll be indebted for, to you, Buck, for the Florida game because... Uh, it still is, uh, if you had to single one play in Georgia's football history, it would be that play, you to Lindsay. And you had to scramble, and thanks to Nat Hudson that you remember, pulled and got a starting linebacker that could have sacked you. And uh, when Buck got it, uh, the uh, rest is history. And that still is Georgia's greatest play. And you have the distinction uh, that uh, no other quarterback in Georgia's history has ever had, and that is to win two SEC championships back-to-back -back and also win the national championship. So thanks for your leadership and what you did. Thanks, Coach. We're going to transition uh, now into some of the Q&A coming, coming at me. Uh, I, I want to start off, I think um, – uh, you know, kind of front and center, we have a, uh, a question from Keller Withers, and I think it's really timely. Uh, it says, do you think all the height these high school recruits get before they even come to college makes it harder for them to buy into the big team little me mentality that you guys uh, grabbed a hold of and ran with? I think it's a, it's a big question on the, the recruiting process these days and the number of stars they stick behind kids and uh, kind of the effect it has. Uh, Thoughts on that? We'll start with you, Coach. <laughs> well, that goes back to character, and Buck referred to that early on, uh, which is so important as an individual and uh, so important because it blends into a team. But uh, you have some players that have to make adjustments when they come, uh, and uh, they, they are those that are able to do that that are really talented and gifted uh, can be uh, great football players uh, for the institution. And then there's some, unfortunately, that uh, uh, never have been able to make that adjustment and maybe didn't uh, ever perform as capable as they are. But uh, at the same time, uh, 
it's it's all about a character, uh, and a lot of it stems from being at home. A lot of it stems uh, from good discipline in the high school coaches. A lot of it stems from de good discipline at home and fathers, uh, and that blends right into the team concept. Anybody else want to take a stab at that one? <laughs> well, I just got through uh, with a about seven years coaching a youth league travel baseball team. And I just saw it running rampant with the young people now that, you know, if the son wasn't playing shortstop and hitting third, they would change teams immediately. And now you see in high school, I, I know there's a quarterback I, I watched a couple of weeks ago here locally that this is his third high school that he's been at. So these days, this new generation, they don't sit around and think about paying dues or waiting their time. They're, they're looking for success now. And so that, that spills over. You're seeing all these transfers now. Uh, South Carolina just lost their two starting cornerbacks that opted out and they're decided to skip the rest of the year and get ready for the NFL draft. And you just didn't see those things. Uh, years ago when, when we played, and I, I'm not trying to say things were better then than they are now, but, you know, it's a different different uh, approach these days. It, it seems to be less about the team and more about me at this point in time. Yeah, and, and I think I think what happens is it's made it a lot more difficult for coaches to create the, the big team little me um, atmosphere around a team. Um, usually, and coaches will tell you, the best teams ever coached were teams where the leadership of the team really handled the team and the coaches coached. I've had several coaches mention that to me. It makes it so much easier for them to coach when, when the leadership of the team drives the team. Uh, and I think, like Buck said, it's just a, a, just a different day and things are, a lot of rules are different. And that atmosphere is I think makes it's not impossible I think you see it happening I mean I think uh, uh, coach Saban's done a good job of, of creating that atmosphere and I think uh, we're creating a, a pretty good job of, of that we're still not where we want to be but it does make it really hard for coaches and even the leadership of that team to create that you know mentality of team me uh, first yeah I, I think I tell you what, in, in this day and age, I think the coaches that are able to tear, tear, tear athletes down, or maybe that's a harsh word, but break them down and then build them up based on the fundamentals of football and the character of the head coach and the coaching staff, and then build them in a team way so that they understand the goals and what they should do on a daily basis and have the discipline to be able to do the things consistently right and to have that effort to do it right. When I came, when I came from Charlotte and arrived at the University of Georgia, I came from a household, a military background. And so discipline was high on the totem pole in our house. And once I stepped on the campus at UGA, that is the same thing I saw from Coach Dooley. So it was an easier transition for me because I understood being told to do something one time and then doing it and getting it done immediately, right now, without hesitation and doing the right things. And so I think a lot of kids these days have problems. It's okay that they come in with all of the accolades and all of the five stars and things, but oftentimes they don't get to go through that process of what Frank is talking about and coach is talking about in terms of, of being humbled and broken down somewhat and then being built up by the players and the coaches so that they then can see and have the correct vision of what should be done and how it should be done and have the team first. And I think that's part of what's missing these days, but the more successful coaches, I think, are able to do that in their own way and are very effective at it. That's well said. Well, let's, let's jump back into your playing days. Um, your, pre, your favorite pregame ritual or superstition, Scott Williams is asking, mine is a uh, Chick-fil-A biscuit in the morning. If I don't get the Chick-fil-A, <laughs> I'm totally screwing things up. And, and I have to admit, 
I was in St. Simons. I did not get the Chick-fil-A before Florida game this year. It's on me. I apologize. I own it. But, uh, but what was your pregame ritual, man? Pre-game ritual. Gosh, I, I think just uh, saying a prayer, hoping I wouldn't embarrass uh, Valdosta and my family and my teammates. Uh, you know, just drawing strength from prayer prior to the game. Uh, and it just eliminated a lot of the stress for me uh, going out on the field. And uh, uh, just uh, so appreciative of the strength I was able to get from that. I'm really not a superstitious kind of guy. I did like those red pants we used to wear, though. <laughs> we got to see those again this year, but I didn't really have a, a pregame ritual. All right. This question is for Coach Dooley. We'll kick it off. You know, you guys had the 12th man. His name was Larry Munson. Uh, <laughs> so many great calls during, during you guys' playing days, but give me one that stood out, that sugar falling from the sky. <laughs> well, I'm glad one thing I didn't have to listen to him doing the game. <laughs> he would have driven me crazy. I, I had always thought about things in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be the most optimistic because I wanted to be prepared and make sure that every possibility is covered. But uh, being around him, you get totally pessimistic. <laughs> He'd come there. He would say, how are we going to stop their wide receivers? We don't have any speed. They're too big in the office. I said, Munson, get away from me. <laughs> we'll call the game. Well, the greatest uh, calls is when one night I came home and somebody had a highlight of all of Munson's calls. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he called a kick against Kentucky, Rex Robinson kicked a field goal. Nobody ever knew if it was good or not. He just said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I guess it was good. But, uh, Buck blew to Lindsey Scott, my gosh. Uh, run, he, Lindsey! He, yeah, run, Lindsey, run. He broke, a, broke a chair. I mean, yeah, you could go on. A Hobdale boot and so forth. He was a really folk hero, and, uh, and the fans loved him. But again, I'm glad I didn't have to listen to him when I was <laughs> <laughs> Frank, I know, uh, Frank, I know you're, uh, uh, you're kind of on the retired side, but do you find yourself, you know, helping Kirby coach on game days these days? Phil Kenny wanted to know if uh, you guys were armchair quarterback in it or do you have the hotline phone to it? No, I mean, I, I try to enjoy it. I understand I had my, you know, we had our time. Um, and, it's, you know, it's, they, they, nobody knows the game better than Kirby and the coaches that are coaching. They see the players every day. They see how they perform down after down. And so uh, from you know our point of view, we're not there. So to criticize his decisions, it'd be uninformed on our, on our side. I try to enjoy the games. I really do. Um, I, I still I consider myself a student. I kind of watch the line and the linebackers because I can tell how things are going to develop based on how those guys play because it's one in the trenches. Uh, so I, I look at, I watch the games more from that perspective than I do from a general fan perspective, which you're watching the ball the whole time. Um, but no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't get involved. It's, uh, it's their job. They get paid big bucks. Um, see coach Dooley, if you wait about if you stayed on another 10, 15 years, you'd be making $7 million a year. <laughs> My wife still gets mad at me. I said, why would you all of a sudden start to make money and then you give up coaching? <laughs> Whenever they, I'm just glad you didn't get in politics, Coach. Yeah, yeah, not, not that. Whenever they publish the salaries, I have to hide in newspapers. She gets mad all over again. <laughs> this question is for you. Uh, I know you were a sophomore in '81. Uh, I think the Georgia Florida game was on TV the other night. I think, in fact, it was on Friday night uh, of the Georgia Florida weekend. I think it ended in the same score. Um, Georgia having a great drive in the fourth quarter to win. And Bob just wanted to know, what do you remember for, from that game kind of stood out for you? Man, I just always remember some knockdown drag outs for Florida. You know, I think, uh, I think, Buck, was that the game I caught a wheel route from you on this? Uh, yeah, you had a beautiful, that was a beautiful route and what a great <laughs> catch. <laughs> uh, that was awesome. <laughs> 
Yeah, that that was that was one standout play from that game. But we just had, you know, Florida had a lot of great athletes, and 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 of course, you know, a lot of the players, and so that's what made it so fun, so exciting, so intense, um, because you knew a lot of the players, and they had a lot of great athletes, um, and so you could always count on it being a tremendous crowd. The atmosphere was always just you could feel it, the tension in the air thickness and 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 it was always a game that you didn't really need much to get you hyped for <laughs> because as soon as you walked into that stadium you could feel it you could sense it and it was a beautiful thing and uh you know I always cherish the Florida Georgia games and that was uh that was another one that fell in our favor hey, hey Scotty and you could smell the bourbon when you walked out of the tunnel <laughs> Yes, you could. Only stadium that I've ever been when you walk out, of, you hit a wall of <laughs> bourbon smell. Unbelievable. Yes, you could. <laughs> and I'd say one thing, the week of the, of the Florida game, I would come into our first meeting and most everybody would, would be sitting up a little bit straighter, a bit <laughs> more attentive. And you could tell with the very first <laughs> meeting on Monday that this was big. That yeah. game, that's how big it was. Yeah. This yeah. question is uh, from Heather Parker. Uh, uh, outside of the three of you guys together tonight, which of your teammates were you closest to while you played? And who do you, you guys still try to keep in touch with on a regular basis? Y'all can fire away anytime. Well, I'd hate to point anybody out. Uh, you know, we were all close. And, you know, I had some uh, guys from my hometown. Keith Middleton was a linebacker that played with Frank there at that linebacker spot. And, you know, it was just so uh, grateful to have a guy I could trust and really love that was already up in Athens on the team. And it really influenced my decision. And then John Lastinger, who followed me as the quarterback and did some great things, led Georgia to a uh, – a SEC title and a shot at another national title. I just uh, grew up with John and we were always close growing up. And it's uh, just, just such a pleasure to have people that you grew up and trusted to be there with you. And, you know, all these guys were special though. And I, I treasured all the relationships that I had with the guys on that team. Yeah, I mean, as far as me, I mean, I, I still stay in touch with almost all the guys. I mean, I can I mean, even Scotty. I mean, we, we I'd call him and it's like we never miss, missed a day. Buck, we'll call each other. He'll call me for something. I'll call him and ask a question and same thing. But um, I, we're close as a team. I just tell you that um, in, in the senior class, we, we have a, a, a texting link that we all text each other and every day everybody's texting each other on that. It's, it's amazing. And we get together uh, once a year as, as, as a senior class. And then of course we have the reunions together, but I mean, we were a close team and I felt like everybody really did uh, love each other. Uh, it was a close knit team and it has stayed on for, 30, for 40 years. So uh, to me, it's, it's remarkable. And, and I'm very proud to, to say that I'm part of that team. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I was real close with the uh, with that freshman group that came in because we were we were really tight, and you know, walking in as freshmen, we thought we were just going to take over everything. <laughs> we were going to have everybody sit down, and we were, you know, coach at the time, Coach Dooley had never had any freshmen to ever start from him. We thought that we were going to have ten that started. <laughs> well, none of us, none of us actually started with the first game. I think it wasn't until Tony Flack came in the next year that a true freshman ever started for Coach Dooley. But yeah, we got the freshman class, Papa Joe Happy, I used to call him Papa Joe Happy. I catch, used to catch rides home with him. You know, I love catching up with Buck and Frank and, 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 and Brian, you saw right before we jumped on the back and forth that Frank and I had. And, you know, I, I was texting with me, Cleaver Weaver, literally this week and last week. I play golf with James Brown every Saturday. You know, Mike Weaver was my roommate the entire time there. And we had an apartment after that, you know, God rest his soul. Uh, but, you know, I keep in touch. I'm on, I talk with DJ and Dale and I do their sports vision show. And so it is, it's amazing, man. A lot of that team, you know, a lot of that team really had a lot of guys that had incredible character. An, an incredible 
wills to succeed. And I think that's part of what allowed us to have the kind of success that we had. And that's the same kind of drive that forces us and makes it easy for us to stay in touch as well. So it's an incredible group and I, I, I'll never forget them. Well, I'll tell you, you, that was the best class in my 25 years that we ever had, though you needed a little humility because of, of uh, thinking you were going to come in. <laughs> but outside of that, that class in four years went 43, four and one, three SEC championships, the national championship, and that record during that four year period was the best in the country over a four year period. So it was a heck of a class, there's no question about it. But the seniors of 1980 was the best senior class that we ever had. And uh, that combination of the freshmen and seniors resulted in the national championship. Yeah. Well said. Well, our, our last few minutes uh, before, we, before we have to turn things off tonight. Well, let's fast forward to kind of the present. And coach, I know they were giving you a hard time about the, the salaries these days. Are you are you surprised about kind of the, the, the enterprise that college football has become, uh, the big salaries, the TV contracts, uh, the technology involved in everything? It's, uh, it's just kind of a little bit of a different animal these days. Yeah, and I'm a little concerned because we really haven't gotten into this whatever it is that they're talking about benefits for the players uh that's still to be addressed but there are some real concerns uh about uh football today and uh, uh i've got some thoughts on it but i don't think it's good to express those right now i'll keep them myself uh, buck this uh you know this is probably a uh a wrong question to ask because it's kind of like Skip Carey being asked about the infield fly rule, but uh, <laughs> you, you get you get quarterback questions on a daily basis during the day on the call-in shows, and uh, I know we we may have some of those types of topics going on in Athens now. But uh, give us your take on the on the uh, players over there in Athens today, and kind of what you've seen so far this year, and what we have to look forward to in the last four games. Hopefully, all four games get played. Well, I'm excited. I'm anticipating we'll see JT Daniels get a shot this Saturday against Mississippi State, and I'm really excited to see him throw the football. I think he's the best passer of the quarterbacks that we have, and we certainly need to unlock this passing game. I was breaking it down earlier today. I think we're 68th in college football and passing, so that's one area we we need to get better, and I think JT Daniels will help us get there. Uh, proud of Stetson Bennett and what he was able to do coming in. I mean, gosh, during the preseason camp, he was not really in the picture as the fifth quarterback on the depth chart, but uh, really love his uh, passion and love for the University of Georgia and totally respect uh, what he's done. Uh, hey, Kirby, I, I think Kirby, he's, he's got this philosophy that you just don't have enough quarterbacks. So I know he's recruited another and Brock Vandegrift that will sign in the upcoming recruiting class. They'll add some more, I'm sure, to the table. But I, I think, you know, what's really uh, affected us offensively is this is our third offensive coordinator in three years. And then without having uh, spring football this year because of the coronavirus really has limited us offensively as far as install, getting comfortable with the new scheme. Uh, has really held us back this year. And that's something that, you know, Kirby and Todd Monken had had no control over. But, uh, you know, encouraged uh, to see uh, JT Daniels this Saturday. I think he's going to help us. And, you know, he, he just may be the quarterback again next season. So uh, excited to see him play. Frank, Scott, uh, keys to closing out the season uh, on a winning note. Your thoughts? Go ahead, Frank. Quite frankly, I mean, and Coach Doolittle will tell you, to have a, a national championship team or a really, really excellent team, you've got to have several things that have to play into. And one, you got to have good players, obviously. Um, you have to have a team that plays together. You have to have good senior leadership. You have to have minimal injuries, and you have to have some luck on your side. Now, I, I believe that you create most of your luck, but occasionally things happen that are beyond what you, anything you did. I think this year <clears throat> they're just facing I – mean, 
the Florida game, the last person you want to lose for that game is a kid that we lost, LeCount. He's the quarterback of the defensive back. Well, Florida's a, I think Florida ranks one or two in passing, uh, and all of a sudden you lose him. You lose a, a defensive lineman. So injuries are really critical. If you go back to 1980, we were very fortunate. We basically had, if I remember correctly, one major injury, and that was to Hunall, who was out for about five or six games. We did come back for the Tech game and played in the uh, Notre Dame game. So to me, I think he's doing the right things. Injuries, how do you control that? I think nobody's ever found the answer to that, that we probably have the best medical staff and the best trainer in the country. Um, I think we have a great opportunity to, to continue to build on what we have. And, um, and this has been a crazy year. So uh, we'll see, we'll see what, what happens. I, I, I don't know about the quarterback situation, what they're thinking about, uh, but I know it takes a total team uh, to win championships and, and that's what they got to do. Yeah, I think, I think they've got to focus. I, I think the old cliche, one game at a time, you know, there are a lot of distractions out there. COVID is rampant. Uh, they got to figure out the quarterback room, but they've got to lock in and focus and band together because now people think there's not a lot to play for. Well, that's wrong. That is totally wrong. Focus, lock in one game at a time. Make sure you take care of your responsibilities individually, and then it'll come together as a team. So I think they've got to really lock in for these last four games and take it one game at a time figure out the quarterback room, and I think we'll finish the, street, the season strong. Thank you for that. And gentlemen, uh, thank each and every one of you for participating tonight. We certainly appreciate you joining us. I want to thank the viewers for joining us tonight. And uh, it's homecoming week, folks. I know that's hard to believe uh, a week out of, of Thanksgiving, but we're, we're up against homecoming. We need to show up and show out uh, this weekend. Uh, alumni.uga.edu is how you can get online and check out all the chapters going on over 90 chapters worldwide now over 330 active uh, or 330,000 active alumni across the world wearing that red and black and cheering on the dogs thanks again for everyone joining us uh, you can check out coach Dooley's latest book uh, we'll provide a link to everyone that has their email address uh, get that online put that in your stocking and uh, get ready for Scott's new book coming out first next year, right, Scott? <laughs> Good Scott, better Scott, great Scott. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Go dogs. Have a wonderful evening. Happy Bye Thanksgiving. Dogs. Thank All you. Right. Appreciate it. <laughs>